It's great to see everybody here this morning. We're going to continue in our study on how to study the Bible. Um, got some good things for us to talk about today, so not just me up here talking, but uh, for us to interact and uh, think about how we study the Scripture. Let's we'll start by going to uh, Father in the Lord's Prayer. Heavenly Father, we recognize you indeed as our God and our Father who has given us life and everything for life, and has given us your word, that if we might study it, we might learn of you and learn of what you'd have us to do to honor and to glorify your name and spread your news of salvation to the world around us. We pray, Father, that you'd help us in our continued efforts to try and understand this word, to make it a part of our lives, not just to know it, but to do it, to do what you'd have us to do, so that we can help instruct others as well. It might increase our faith. We pray particularly this morning for Susan, for her recovery, pray that all would go well with her, and that we would take time to encourage one another in our walk with you, that we might persevere until we spend eternity with you. Through Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So, yeah. So I wanted to start with a, uh, a little quote I found this week. What do you think? Think this makes sense? It, it's it's attributed to Albert Einstein, but there's not um, uh, a lot of evidence that he actually said this, but may have said something along the line. But any fool can know the point is to understand. Mm. Do you think any wisdom to that, or any? Mm -hmm. The devil knows, but he doesn't understand. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. knows that there's a God. Yeah, and Satan and his demons, they know, but it doesn't necessarily make a difference to them. Yeah. I think understanding has the inclusion of the idea of wisdom. Okay. You know, applying what you know. Yeah, applying it, right? Having wisdom to know, okay, what do I do with this? Yeah. Um, there are many, many people in the world who have studied the Bible, read it as literature, and they know it quite well. <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily mean they understand and live by it, right? Um, but, but part of our goal is we want to say, okay, not just to know what it says, we memorize it, we read it, but to be able to understand what it's saying and to do it, right? Yes. I'm reminded of the Jews, how much they pour over Scripture, but they don't understand about Christ. Yeah, there was a lot they knew. But they didn't understand, right? And our goal is we're trying to understand so we can actually do what, is, what God wants to do with that. Okay. Even, even today, someone is coming, someone has come, someone is coming again. That's the way the Bible's written. Yeah. And they missed it all. Yeah. You know? I mean, I'm not trying to rank on them. I just feel, feel sad because it got missed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been missed and it's still being missed today. Yeah, to some degree. Yeah. And we want to. We want to make sure that we're not missing it, right? Okay, right. Good. Yeah. yeah. There's no room for us to be prideful. No, no, and I think that was one of the things I'm just doing a quick review, and that's one thing we brought up last week that I don't have on the slide, is the idea that we need to approach it with humility, that we don't know all the answers, and we should be open to continue to study, continue to learn throughout our lives. <clears throat> but we did talk about, but why, why study the Bible? We kind of touched on it already, but why? Why just read it? Because we don't get as much out of it by just reading. Okay. As if it's okay. Yeah, as we've already commented, we can read it, we can know it, but it doesn't necessarily help us to understand and do. And so we study so we understand well, what is it telling us to do? What does it mean for our life? Yeah. Uh, I'm reminded of Psalms 1 on his law, that he meditate day and night. Mm -hmm. Give you time to think it. Yeah, yeah, Psalm chapter 1 um, talks about, yeah, meditating. I think it's blessed is the man who, uh, I misquoted here, I'm going to turn to that real quick. It says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Um, one of the future classes will actually talk about that whole concept of meditation, which is a little different than study, but those two go hand in hand. Yeah, but what's, what's the goal of studying the Bible? When we talk about, yeah, we ought to study it, but what ultimately is the goal? To be able to defend our beliefs. Okay, to defend our beliefs is certainly one of them, right? We spent quite a bit of time in apologetics to help defend our faith, right? And we need to study the Bible so we know how to defend it, okay? Certainly that's part of it, okay? Anything else? To be like Jesus and do what Jesus did. Yeah, to be more like our Savior, to do Amen. what he wants to do, right? Yeah, to be able to we, apply. Do, we are that. We are that. I keep yeah. talking to God. I am that, but how do I get there? How do, how I, do I close yeah. this yeah. down, yeah. this down, yeah. and be like Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of it comes from his 
word. It, it instructs us. Yeah, we take the time to listen to it, right? Uh, that's one that we read in Romans 15, 4 last week. It says all scripture, you know, is um, passed and written for our word, right? Yeah, okay, good. Um, then we talked about these two terms. What do we mean by exegesis and hermeneutics? Anybody remember? Yeah. Okay. I'm, over, I'm over 70. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's why I do the review sometimes, because the more we repeat things, the better, more likely to stick in our brains, right? But exegesis has the idea to draw out the meaning. The exa means basically to draw out, right? We're trying to draw out the meaning. What did the writer mean when he wrote that? We're trying to draw it out, not read into it. We want it to mean, but draw out the meaning, mm -hmm. right? And, and hermeneutics is basically, it's a fancy word, basically meaning the science and art of interpretation, right? And how when we apply certain rules to interpreting a text to try and find that meaning. So these two work hand in hand, okay? And we'll talk more in depth about them, but just remembering the terms, okay? Okay, question. Yes. Can exegesis be, can it be, um, depending upon your own opinion, or is it only for the <coughs> truth? Which, of course, we are looking for, but do, is it open to one's own? Because if we're pulling it out, that's what we do nowadays. We say, well, I believe it says, and other people said, well, I, you know, if you look around. Mm -hmm. So is that open for? Yeah, so that's one of the things we're going to talk about okay. is, is tr we're trying to draw out the truth of the, the meaning. Truth. But then the application could be varied. You know, yeah, certainly. Okay. But the meaning, there should be one meaning there that we should be able to draw out. Yeah. And we'll talk about that depth and how to get there. Yeah. Uh, hermeneutics would include rightly dividing the word of truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Rightly dividing. Yeah. So we talked about that last week. I think that was in Second Timothy 2 or 3. It talked about you know, uh, being a workman, rightly handling the word of truth, indicating there is a wrong way to handle it, but there is a right way, and we want to make sure we're handling it appropriately. And that's what we're going to talk about today, basically a key to help us to understand it correctly. Yeah, okay. Um, but one of those kind of review questions, do you remember there were four gaps that make it necessary for us to try and interpret what was written? Um, what are the gaps between when this was written and where we're at today? We have to deal with. One of them is simply history, is just time, right? Okay. What are the other, other gaps? Translation. Okay, translation, right? The language. It was written in a very different language that we don't speak, so we have to deal with that lingual gap, that translation. We'll talk more about that next week. Okay. What else? That's two. Yeah. Another one's cultural. Right, the culture in which a lot of this stuff was written. We sometimes we need to understand the culture. Like if we read First Corinthians and we read about you know head covering and stuff, well, how does that apply to us today? And if we don't understand the culture that day, we could misapply it today. So we need to make sure we look at the culture in which it was written, how it meant to them. Then we can apply it properly to us today. Those kind of things. Okay. Um, along with that, some people will actually split it out and say there might be philosophical differences, how people have a world view that's different. How they approach things. Um, the other one too is geographical, right? That a lot of the places we've not been there, and a lot of them don't exist anymore. We have trouble trying to relate when it talks about, you know, where's Jericho, where's Bethlehem, and so forth. Um, so these are things that you know we want to keep in mind as we're trying to understand it. Okay. All right. Well, last at the end of class, I I brought this slide up. Um, this is a uh, a little exercise for us to do in class, maybe help us think about how we get a, go about getting a meaning of something like that. Um, the Naphtunkian Dilemma. This actually comes from a book I'm using, Tommy Let Me Borrow, called Hermeneutics, um, Principles and um, Processes of Biblical Interpretation. And so I paraphrased that um, dilemma on here and something for us to discuss. So, so here's the, the situation. A letter you wrote to a close friend was lost in the mail for 2,000 years. The letter was found and three poets from the Naphtunkian society found the letter translated the letter, and arrived at three different meanings. As a dispassion, maybe heavenly, uh, observer, what advice would you give the poets to resolve the differences? 
They come up with three different meanings. You wrote a letter to your friend. 2,000 years later, three people read it, and they come up with three different meanings. Well, I think it means this. Well, you think it means that. You may think it means something else. What advice would you give to the person? How would you resolve that? Any ideas? Okay. I think about how the Lord Jesus interacted with the people he visited with. Um, on one occasion, he, the guy... I can't remember, I think it was a scribe asked him what's the greatest commandments, and mm -hmm. he said, How readest thou? You know, what mm -hmm. does it say? Right. Yes. Okay. Another place he said, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Mm -hmm. I think that would be primary. If in this letter here is what did the person say? Okay. All right. Go back and see, okay, what did the person say? Okay. All right. Now we're assuming that you that you know if you wrote this letter that you wrote in a way that's understandable, right? That's you're a decent writer. Um, in this morning's bulletin, if you read the article, it's an article I wrote, and when I wrote it, it made sense to me. But I sent it to Shannon. She came back on one of my sentences and says, "Does this mean this or does it mean that?" So I wasn't as clear as I could have been. You know, so she had there were two different meanings she could go. So she came back to me, and I said, "No, this is what I meant it to say." So we changed the wording around so it made more sense, okay? Yeah, okay. So how might that relate to this dilemma? Is it possible there actually are three different meanings to that letter you wrote? If you, if, it's to us or? No, let you, let's say, Sandra, that you wrote a letter to Keith. Sure. Okay, and years later, somebody finds that note and they read it and they say, oh, I think Sandra meant this. Mm -hmm. And then Marcia says, no, I think it meant this. And Bob says it meant this. Is it possible you meant three different things when you wrote that letter? Possibly, sure. But yeah, and that's what my question is. Unbeknownst, I mean, are there, did I intend it to be three different things? Right. Or, okay, yeah, that's well, the question. it's possible, certainly. Okay. Sure. Okay. Well, I, I would disagree with that. Yeah. I never intend for three meanings. Yeah. Now, if I'm being ironic, I'm hoping that the intended meaning <laughs> okay. comes through irony. Okay. But how can you communicate if sure. you leave it open to three different meanings? What's the point? Yeah. Sure. Good point. Yeah. I, I, I you agree. were just saying that there's three sides to any conversation. There's what you think you said, what you really said. <laughs> And then the other person, what they think they heard. Yeah, okay. Yeah. True. Yeah. So in this day and age, I'm still going to go with, yes, it's possible. Okay. Because communication is at a, especially with our texts. Oh, I can't believe people. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, no, and that, that's true. I mean, we, particularly when we talk about the written word, there's oftentimes a lot of the, uh, the nuances of speech that get lost, right? Um, and so the written word can be more trouble problematic to try and get understand the meaning, right? Simply because when I'm speaking, I can emphasize different words, accentuate different words, or you can ask questions, you know, to say, okay, is that what really what you meant to say? Is that, I'm hearing this, is that what you were trying to communicate, right? Um, so it can be problematic, but I think all of us would probably recognize when we're trying to say something, communicate something, we have some meaning we're trying to communicate, right? That we have something in mind some meaning behind what we're trying to say, yes. We do have a comfort in this, is that when we're puzzling over the scriptures, we have the Holy Spirit to help us understand, okay. because he was there that did the inspiring at yeah. God's command. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about that in coming classes, you know, the role of the Holy Spirit in this mm -hmm. whole thing, yeah, okay. Because it is, it, it is an important aspect, right? Not the only one, okay. I, I, I would be really careful and speaking of the word of God as every verse having three different meanings, oh, yes. because there would be no point in the word. Right. Well, if God can't communicate to his own creation, yes. yeah. now it's true, as you said, language changes. Yes. And you have to have a translation that is accurate. Yes. Uh, and sometimes we talk about the Greek and the Hebrew in our teaching just to emphasize this is what was used, therefore mm -hmm. let's pay attention yes. to the meaning of those words. Right. A lot of people want to go to an English dictionary to define the words in the Bible. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the place to go. <laughs> no. You go to a Greek or Hebrew dictionary. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, and we'll get into those those um, those details. Um, mm -hmm. Particularly next week, we'll start talking about translations. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, if if this is the Bible and God wrote this Bible, it seems like He ought to have a meaning to it. He was intending to have a meaning to it, right? Just like when you write a letter, you have a meaning you're trying to a message you're trying to communicate. And if if everybody can come up with their own meaning, <coughs> what's the point? If everybody can come up with what I think this means then what's the point? How could we ever be united yeah. if everybody can come up with their own meaning, right? God can say what it means. Yeah, if God's God, he should be able to communicate, you know, yeah. but sometimes it takes us effort to extract that. That's what we're talking about in this class, yeah. yeah. And he means what he says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. There, you know, there are topics that are just difficult. Oh, absolutely. There are <laughs> and, no and questions. And Peter yeah. mentions he that does. Paul yes. sometimes talked about difficult things. Yes. And, so, and there are things today that people have been, you know, arguing, well, not arguing, but looking at for 2,000 years trying to figure out exactly what that meaning is, yeah. yeah. But the basic message is certainly understandable, yeah. There's aspects that we struggle with. You know, the book of Revelation is one that people still struggle with. But even without the book of Revelation, we can, we can know how to be saved, right? So, okay. I sometimes think that we're... We only reach full understanding when we are open. Yes. Open to God's word, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and that's what we talked a little about last week, is coming to the Bible with an attitude of, of reverence. It's his word and of humility to be open to what is it trying to say, right? And not us trying to say, this is what I want it to mean. Yes. This is what I think it should be. <laughs> yeah. So good point. Okay. Yeah, but I think this illustrates the point that, you know, if we write something that we recognize, you know, um, you know, who's going to be the best person to give the meaning to what they write? The person who wrote it. The person who wrote it, right? Yeah. They're going to be the best one. Just like I mentioned the article I wrote for the Burlington, right? I'm the best one to tell what that, what I was trying to say, right? I wrote it, right? So the person who writes it, they're the best one to give the answer, right? Okay. Yeah. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Yeah. So who wrote the Bible according to the Bible itself? Who's the author? behind this. I think you've already kind of alluded to it already. But. The Holy Spirit. Yeah, I mean, Bible. yeah, yeah. It, it's God, the Holy Spirit, it was inspiring <clears throat> men what to write, right? Um, that men were moved by the Holy Spirit to write what we have. So God's behind the Bible. He's the one that authored it, according to the Bible itself. And we looked at these scriptures last week, 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is God-breathed, is profitable for correction, reproof, and so forth. Um, in First Peter or Second Peter, chapter one, uh, verses twenty and twenty-one, we looked at this, those verses as well. Um, but I'll just re read this to remind us. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible is claiming. It was the Holy Spirit inspiring men what to write. Okay, so this is what the Bible is saying. Now, who is Jesus? Okay. God. He's the Son of God. He is God. Um, if we go to John chapter 1, the first couple verses, yeah, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. Um, and we drop down to verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I mean, so Jesus is the word. He is God. He came in the flesh. Okay. So if the best person to give us the meaning is the person who wrote it, and if God is the author of the Bible, and Jesus is God, come in the flesh... You suppose his perspective on scripture would be important? I, I would think so. I mean, <laughs> he better than any other person who's ever lived would be the best person to help us to see how do we read and understand what God wrote. That's why I like the verse, be still and know that I am God. God yeah. Okay. We let our own emotions and thoughts interfere. Yeah, oftentimes we do, yeah. Um, yeah, so if we take a look at Jesus and how he 
look at the Bible. That will help us in being able to look at the Bible in the same way and get the meaning out of it, okay? So let's take a look at some verses. Um, let's go to Mark. We have Matthew and Mark, second gospel. Mark chapter 12, verse 36. We're not going to be exhausted in this. There are many, many verses we can refer to, but I want to show kind of a, a variety of verses to help us to see how Jesus looked at Scripture. Okay. Um, we're going to read verse 35 and verse 36. Okay. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, How is it that the teaching of the law say that Christ is the Son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David calls him, himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? Okay, so Jesus asked a pretty hard question here. And we're not going to try and wrestle with all that. What I want us to see in this verse is, what did Jesus say about the scriptures? Where did they come from? Okay, he said, yeah. He says, David speaking by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus himself is saying what we read in 1 Peter, or 2 Peter, right? It was the Holy Spirit moving men along to write it, okay? So Jesus is acknowledging the scriptures you know, yeah, came from the Holy Spirit. Right? That, yeah, yeah. And, and he's confirming in what was written, and he says it was you know, speaking about the Christ, and speaking about the Son of David. Well, we may come back to this one and explore a little bit more later. Um, but the main thing is that Jesus is saying scripture is from God, okay? How about Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18? This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. There's a lot of people who are at least familiar with that term. And here toward the beginning of that, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. What is he saying there about the word? Timeless? Okay. Timeless, perhaps, okay. Is he saying it's full of errors? Is he saying it's full of contradictions? He says part of it's going to come true and part is not? No. He's saying all of it has to be fulfilled. Not the smallest letter or dot is going to disappear. Every bit of it <clears throat> is right. Okay. So people today sometimes want to say, well, the Bible is full of contradictions. It's got errors and stuff. But is that what Jesus claimed? He's the son of God. He's the one. Like the writing of this, he ought to know better than anybody else. Okay. Right? Yeah, he was there when the Old Testament was written. He was. He was around, yeah, before it was ever written, right? So he ought to know. He ought to know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. While we're in Matthew, let's turn to Matthew chapter 15. Um, the first few verses here. A little bit longer reading here. Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your traditions? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, Whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is a gift devoted to God, he is not to honor his father with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your traditions. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, and their teachings are the rules taught by men. So what is Jesus saying about the word of God here? Anything? He says, oh, we can change it. We can bend it to fit what we want today. Is that, is that what he's saying? Stay with what is there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He says, we, we can get ourselves caught up and we can break the rules trying to keep them, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he, he's, you know, basically effectively saying the 
There's authority to the word of God. The commands of God have got authority to them. They ought to be obeyed. Okay? It, it's also interesting that they had traditions for centuries. Yes. We're talking centuries the rabbis yes. taught these things. Yes. And Jesus comes and says, no, you right. missed the point. You missed the point, you exactly. You put your traditions equal to the word of God. And, or even ahead. you know, in 3,000 years, we're not changing much. No. <laughs> no, yeah, we talked about this very well, the past, similar passion with Mark the other night, uh, yeah, in Bob's class, yeah, and and we can do that, I and mean, we we can get caught up in our tradition that we make them equal or above God's law, and Jesus saying, no, we've got to go back to God's law, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, all right, okay. While we're in Matthew, let's take a look at another one, Matthew chapter twenty-six and verse fifty-four. Um, this is when Jesus is being arrested and um, Peter is pulling out a sword to whack off Malchus's ear. Um, and Jesus says in verse 52, Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? So what did Jesus Think about prophecy. God breathed. God breathed. Okay. It has to be fulfilled. It's true. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So more than once he talks about that. Okay. Uh, maybe a couple more. Luke chapter 16, verse 29. Got Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Numbers 16. Chapter 16. 29. So this is a, a, an occasion of um, what we call the rich man and Lazarus, which some people look at as a parable, other people look at as more of a, um, a story of, or not story, but an occasion of what heaven and hell is going to look like, uh, judgment scene and so forth. And at the end of that, um, in this particular passage, a rich man dies, goes to a place of torment. Lazarus, who is a poor man, a beggar, who didn't have much dies, goes to Abraham's bosom, is being comforted, and the rich man is saying, hey, send Lazarus back to tell my brothers I don't want him to come to this place. And Jesus says, um, or Abraham replied, um, in this story, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. So he's saying, what? Listen to the scripture, listen to sure. Moses, okay? So, I mean, here Jesus is saying, you know, we recognize Moses as the, and there's other places too, where Jesus credits Moses as the author of the first five books, um, that Moses the author of many of these things, where he talks about divorce and remarriage, he talks about Moses giving the command about divorce. Um, but here he's saying, yeah, we need to listen to the Old Testament, right? He's telling them, this is the word of God. Okay. All right. Um, Let's see, one more. John chapter 5. We've gone Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John chapter 5, verse 39. And here he's speaking to um, some Jews who do not believe in him. And they're asking for, you know, witnesses or testimony about himself. Um, and Jesus says in verse 39, he says, You diligently study the scriptures because you think that, that by them you possess eternal life. These scriptures that testify, these are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. See, yeah, okay. Does, is he condemning them for studying? No, he says you study them, that's probably a good thing. But what is he saying about the scriptures? What are they pointing to? He doesn't understand. He didn't understand. It was pointing to Christ. To Christ. It was pointing to him. Had they understood them, they'd recognize these. It says, these are the scriptures that testify about me. Um, then dropping down to verse 45, or 45 40 through 47. But do not think I'll accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on no. whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? So here again, he's giving you know, credence to the fact that Moses wrote you know, the law that they live by. 
Um, but he also says, if you believe Moses, you believe me. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, so as we look through these scriptures then, we can see that Jesus certainly considered these to be from God. It was God breathed. They were prophecies to be fulfilled. They're authoritative, right? They spoke of him. Okay. All right. Um, we can also look at some other passages about his view. And I, and I want to kind of quickly go through these, and there's a point to these. Um, but I want to get on to a couple other things here, too. Um, we see in Matthew chapter 19, I think I've already, I already alluded to this verse already. Uh, here Jesus is talking about divorce. Um, this question came up. And in uh, Matthew chapter 19, verse 3, some Pharisees came to him, came to Jesus to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? This was a question that they had in their society. Can you divorce for any reason or are there specific things? Jesus' reply was, haven't you read that the beginning, the creator, made them male and female, and he said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Okay? I, I want to point out a couple things here. One, he speaks about creation. Two, he speaks about male and female. He created them. Okay? Those are key things. You remember in our apologetic study, we're talking about the idea of evolution. Do you think from this passage here that Jesus believed that we somehow came from an ape? Or do you think that he believes that God actually created them? <laughs> in Jesus' own statements would be, no, he created them. He created the male and female. Okay. He would know because he was there. He would know he was there. So he's the best one, again, to help us to understand and interpret right? Um, what he has to say. Um, and there's awfully more we can say here because there's more to this text we can go on and talk about divorce, but I wanted to key in on that aspect in particular. Um, you know, and he's basically saying, and essentially he's not given a full answer, but there it says, can we divorce for any reason? He's saying, you know, let not man separate. God joined them together. We shouldn't be pulling them apart. Right? Okay. There's more depth to it. But, um, but that's also while we're in Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 10. We're going to stay in the book of Matthew for these um, passages here. Um, so Matthew chapter 10 and verse 15 in particular. Okay. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as wolves. Okay. So from this passage, did Jesus consider Sodom and Gomorrah historical actual towns and people, would you say? Okay, obviously why? If they were fictional towns, if they were mythical towns, would judgment have any impact on them? He says it will be more, Sodom, more uh, tolerable for this town than for Sodom and Gomorrah, the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. He speaks about judgment. Why would he judge a mythical or town? That doesn't make any sense, right? So he's basically saying, no, they were real, the people that were real. Okay. And this is part of the point I'm trying to get out, that Jesus is looking at, when he talks about the Old Testament, he's looking at it as history. We see this over and over again. Again, while we're in Matthew, go to Matthew chapter 12, just a couple chapters over, verse 39 through 41. We'll read th verse 38 because that leads into Jesus' answer. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, said to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For if Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation condemn it, for they repented the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. Okay. So again, did Jesus look at Jonah as being a historical figure or as a mythical story, an allegory? He was real, so was Nineveh. 
Okay, yeah, Nineveh was real. The people of Nineveh were real. He's going to talk, he talks again here about judgment. If Jonah was just a mythical story, that, you know, why would he use it in terms of the history and judgment? Okay. So he looked at it as history. Okay. Uh, one more, uh, Matthew chapter 24. Okay. Verse 38 through 41. So it says, for Jesus says, for in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left, two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken, and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day our Lord will come. So does it look like he was looking at Noah as a mythical story or as historical? Historical. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people today want to say, well, the flood didn't exist, right? That Noah's just a made-up story. Okay. But Jesus, again, as the author of this, he treats it historically. Okay. Yes? Plus they found green fossils up on mountains. Yeah, we yeah. There's all sorts of things we can look at in terms of the flood and the evidence for it and stuff. Yeah, um, but the point I'm trying to make through all, all of this is that Jesus looked at the Old Testament, all these Old Testament stories, a lot of ones that people want to say they're more allegorical or they're mythical. He looked up on them as history. Now, if he's the one that wrote it, he ought to be the best one to tell us whether they're mythical or not, right? That, that's the point we're trying to get. He sees this is the Word of God. What he wrote is history. It's not just stories to try and lead us to a better understanding. Okay. Um, one last one here in this piece. Um, I said it was Dan Matthew. We're going to go to Luke chapter 11 because it's mm -hmm. kind of important. Um, Luke chapter 11, verse 50 and 51. Okay. Yeah, here he's in, in this section, Jesus speaking woe to the uh, Pharisees and teachers of law because they've, they've missed the boat, um, a lot of things. And he gets down to the end here in verse 50, and he says, therefore this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that have been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Okay. So again, did he... Do you think he looked at Abel and Zechariah as historical or as, you know, mythical? Yeah, historical. Okay. Yeah, and Abel was the first one uh, to shed his blood. Zechariah, actually, Zechariah is not the last book in our Old Testament, but he's the last prophet. Um, but he was killed as well. Um, so Jesus is saying all those prophets, um, you know, um, are historical. And all that. Okay. Well, I was going to ask, what do we learn from all this then? When we look at the Bible, what should we learn in trying to approach the Bible? Should we treat it as all kind of mythical stories? Is that what God intended? Or did he intend this to be history? For our learning, right? Okay. I mean, allegories can be for learning too, and we, can, we use you know, all these kind of things. But what God wrote was meant to be historical, right? Okay. Yeah. I think we give priority to the statements of Christ because he was there. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And that's why going through this a little bit is because he's going to be the best authority to help us to see, okay, how do we handle scripture, okay? Um, one more little piece I want to look at this as well then is how Jesus actually used scripture in his life. Um, let's go back to the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 4. And you're probably familiar with, many of you are probably familiar with this. Um, this is after Jesus has been baptized and he's led by the Spirit um, into the wilderness or desert to be tempted by Satan. Um, and I'm reading from Matthew chapter 4, verse 2. Now, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdom of the world and their splendor. I'll give all this to you, he said, if you'll bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. Okay. So how did Jesus use scripture? Direct statements. Okay, direct statements, quoted it, okay? Okay. And for what purpose? Just to show that he knew what the Bible said? I know what I wrote. To defend what he believed. Okay, defend what he believed. Okay. And, and what did he believe? The, the word that was written. Okay, the word that was written, it's authoritative, right? It ought to be, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he quotes that as a way to defeat Satan, right? What Satan, and so. I mean, this is one of the reasons that we encourage people today then to memorize scripture and remember it, because we can use it when Satan tempts us, just like Jesus did, you know, to help to ward off the you know, temptation and stuff. To affirm what is right and to resist what yeah. is wrong. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's exactly what Jesus did. But we also see in this passage that Satan himself used scripture. Right? But then Jesus came back with another scripture. Said, yeah. Go and test the Lord. Yeah. Satan so, didn't rightly divide the word of truth. No. No, he doesn't. Right. He can make it sound like it's right. And that's why, and again, that's why we want to study it to find, okay, what did God mean? Not what Satan's trying to tell me it means, you know, right? Um, you know, think about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God says, the day you eat this, you will die. And say, wow, that's not really true. You know, God just doesn't want you, you know, to be like him. You know? uh, yeah, Satan's always been doing that kind of thing. So, I mean, knowing scripture and being able to use that uh, is helpful. God himself used scripture to help defeat Satan. And if, if it's good enough for God, it's good enough for me. If, if, if Jesus, as God, but also as man, needed to use scripture, you know, we probably do too. Here's another passage, and again, there's a, a similar passage in the, uh, well, other uh, gospel accounts, but about the Sabbath. Um, the Matthew chapter 12, about the first nine verses here. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they looked, said, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. You're breaking the law. He answered, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple desecrate the day, and yet are innocent? I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord, of the Sabbath. Okay. So how did Jesus use scripture here? Yeah. Use for correction. Okay, for correction, okay. Correcting their faulty thinking about the Sabbath, right? Yeah. That they have said, yeah, the, the, the law said you shall do no work on the Sabbath, right? It's a day of rest, okay? And the Pharisees had taken that to the nth degree to make sure they didn't violate it. They had come up with all sorts of rules to make sure they didn't violate it. But what did they have missed? Okay. Yeah, he says, so this gets down in verse 7, gets down into kind of where we're trying to get. Um, if you had known what these words mean, go study, 
go dig it out. What, are the, what, am I, what is God saying? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now, I think there's another place that um, he used that same thing against him as well. That there are certain things, he says, there are important things that we need to get, right? To get the big picture. Too often we get caught down in the little nitty gritty and we can miss the big picture, right? Um, and so keeping that in mind, he says, I, you know, Son of God is Lord of the Sabbath. And elsewhere he'll say the Sabbath was created for man, not man for the Sabbath. Yes. Um, elsewhere, too, Jesus taught that it was okay to sustain life on the Sabbath. Like yeah, he talked there's... about him pulling the ox out of the well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then he healed the lady that was bent over on mm -hmm. the Sabbath. So he was sustaining life. Yeah. And uh, of course, you rest on the Sabbath, but it's okay to sustain life. And they missed that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Jesus, on several occasions, this is just one of several occasions on the Sabbath, he was trying to teach, you know, what Sabbath was meant for. And again, he's the author of it. He ought to know what's best, what can be done, can't be done. Yeah. So, um, so again, looking at the fact that he's using Scripture and trying to teach them to see the big picture about who God is and what he wants them to do. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, this one, we, we kind of looked at this one. Oh, no, we didn't. Um, Matthew chapter 22 and verse 23. Okay, we're going to run out of time here. Okay. Um, it says, That same day, the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and have children for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died. Since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, the resurrection, whose wife will she be in heaven? Um, of the seven, since all of them were married to her. Okay. So a question about the law and about heaven. Okay, so Jesus replied, You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They'll be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. The crowds heard this. They were astonished at his teaching. Okay. So here again, he's trying to correct you know, people's use of scripture they didn't fully understand. Um, yes, on this verse he says, you know, when his brother dies, man dies, his brother should marry and carry on the line. But then in heaven, you know, we're not given in marriage, he says. We're not going to be married. Um, won't have any need for that. But he also goes on to say that because um, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, um, he says that when God wrote, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, it's God living, not the dead. So again, Jesus uses scriptures to help correct and to help reprove. Okay, what we've read in 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16, right? Okay. Um, while we're here, then Jesus actually asks a question. We read this one earlier. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked him, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Okay, um, we won't try and answer that question here today, but this is the type of thing that study can help us to try and draw out, right? But here he's asking a question. He's using scripture to try and help lead them deeper into understanding God, okay? Um, we could go to Luke chapter 24, we're running out of time. Uh, where Jesus explains, he opens up and explains what the prophecies were all about, it uh, tells us. Okay. So Jesus, you know, used scriptures. What does this tell us about scriptures? They're what? They're true. They're true. They and, they're, and they're useful. Yes. Right? Exactly what Timothy said, or Paul said to Timothy. They're useful. Well, not only we're training, useful, correct, but right? they were they were written for us yes, yeah. for a life. To glorify right, God exactly. and to do yeah. right in yeah. the world. Yeah. Okay. Because of what the world is now, we are set apart to do the right thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. 
So one last question we'll close on, on this little piece of study. How did the people of Jesus' day respond to Jesus' use of Scripture? Did they say, oh, you have no clue what you're talking about, Jesus? They were astonished. They were astonished as teaching, right? It wasn't like the rest of them, right? This is a different country. And none of these Pharisees he was correcting, none of them said, Jesus, no, you got it all wrong, right? You're saying, no, it's all baloney. I didn't recognize that. He's got some wisdom there. So again, all these things are pointing to the fact that Jesus is probably our best single source to how we start approaching Scripture. Okay. So we'll keep that in mind as we learn more of these rules of hermeneutics and try and pull out meaning. That Jesus looked at Scripture, they are from God, that they are authoritative, that they are true. It's all, it's all true from beginning to end. Okay. All right, let's close with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we again come to you to thank you for all you've done for us and today to thank you for your son Jesus who came and lived a perfect life but also helped to instruct us about your word your scripture to show the truth of your word to show its infallibility to show its historicity and to show its application in our lives father we pray that we continue to learn and to study and learn how to study that we indeed may be able to draw out what you intended to have us know that we might do it we might live it in a way that brings honor and glory to you forever. Through Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone.